Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask everyone here in the house if you'll be so kind to check cell phones one last time and see that they're turned off. Thank you, Larry. Amazing how many speakers actually start doing that when I say that. We will post the program on our website within 24 hours for your future reference. And of course, our internet viewers are always welcome to email us with questions or comments, simply writing those to speaker at heritage.org. Our guest today, Dr. Larry Schweikert, is a native of Arizona. He earned his bachelor and master's degree at Arizona State University and received his doctorate from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Throughout his high school and college, however, he spent most of his time playing drums in a variety of rock bands. As a rock drummer, he was part of several groups, one of which opened for Steppenwolf, among other performers, for those old enough to remember them. His first film, Rockin' the Wall, about rock music's part in bringing down communism, began airing on PBS this week and will continue throughout this year. Dr. Schweikert serves on the faculty at the University of Dayton, where he has taught business, economic history, as well as military history. He is the author of more than a dozen books, including first, A Patriot's History of the United States, which he co-authored. Other topics on which he has written include national defense, history and historiography, and the U.S. economy. A television series based upon Patriot's history of the United States is currently in development as well. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Schweikert to Harry today to hear about his newest book, A Patriot's History of the Modern World, which in this case is going to be from 1898 to just after the Second World War. Please join me in welcoming Larry Schweikert. Larry, would you join? Well, thanks so much uh, to Heritage Foundation for inviting me here. It's really an honor, and it's one that I wish my father was alive to see. Heritage is one of those uh, great bastions of liberty in a swelling sea of collectivism. You probably didn't know that you were getting uh, somebody here that was a uh, previous rock drummer. Uh, this later became significant learning uh, as a learning experience when I began working on this, uh, this film. Uh, but all along, my experiences in the rock band were actually pretty informative. I tell my students I know all about communism uh, because I was in a rock band. We shared everything, had nothing, and starved. <laughs> when Mike Allen and I wrote A Patriot's History of the United States in 2004, we identified three major elements that made up Americanism. Nevertheless, we never really provided a definition of American exceptionalism. And... Uh, during our revisions over time, we kind of corrected that for the next edition that we hope will be out next year. Even in 2004, it seemed a natural progression to move toward a history of the world, especially the modern world. It's the modern world that we see the true fullness of American liberty and prosperity on display and under attack. Through an Amazon book review of Patriots' History of the United States, I met Dave Doherty an Arkansas businessman, historian, computer expert uh, from Evening Shade. Yes, there is an Evening Shade, Arkansas. We first began a top-to-bottom review of any errors remaining in Patriots history of the United States. And then over time, I, I discovered he's a wonderful co-author, and so I asked him to help me with Patriots history of the modern world. He proved especially good in areas where I was weak. And as a former intelligence officer in the Army, he brought a new perspective to the Cold War, especially in the second volume that we're working on now. And um, as John mentioned, this is volume one, goes up to 1945. And volume two will be out about this time next year, 1946 to the present. Um, I have to warn readers up front, especially those who've seen me speak before, uh, probably know me for a little more uh, lighthearted or comic insertions, but this is a very sober and serious book. After all, uh, the period from 1898 to 1945 is an era dominated by two unspeakably deadly world wars sandwiched around a nearly worldwide depression and characterized by such loathsome villains as Mussolini, Stalin, and Hitler. I don't even think Joe Biden could laugh at that material. 
And while we have some sidebar sections, one of my favorite uh, is a comparison and contrast between the world's three leading architects of the day, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Tony Gowdy, and Walter Gropius, who epitomized nature, God, and man in that order, or Robert Perry's daring race for the North Pole. The bulk of this book is dedicated to those political forces that uh, reshaped the century. As one who gravitates toward the great man theory in most of my history, I was almost at a loss for words last week at a book signing event when a questioner asked me, who's the most important person in your book? Dawned on me, this really isn't a book about most important people. It's a book about great ideas and terrible ideas, ideas that in the course of the century were tested in the most climactic of ways, war. But the most important of the ideas that we discuss is something many writers and intellectuals pay lip service to, American exceptionalism, but which no one has really defined. We were kind of surprised as we went through to find there really wasn't a good definition of American exceptionalism. So I think that's our first accomplishment in Patriot's history of the modern world. We examine and define American exceptionalism through the identification of what we call the four pillars. These pillars shaped America, and then those same pillars were often largely or even entirely ignored in shaping uh, the post-war world in World War I, and then later in the decolonization of the Third World, which is part of the second volume. This book follows a 50-year struggle between those we call constitutionalists who want to strengthen the four pillars and progressives who want to destroy them. What are the four pillars? Well, first, America was founded on the Christian religion and predominantly influenced by Protestantism. While by the 20th century, Catholics and Jews played an important role, the culture in 1900 was still fundamentally Protestant and even the progressives emerged from the liberal Protestant churches. This reinforced the second exceptional pillar, common law, which posits that God is given, or that the law is given from God to the people, and it bubbles upward to the rulers. This gives us the government of the people, by the people, and for the people that Lincoln referred to. Common law stands in stark opposition to almost every other nation on earth that has developed some form of civil law in which law trickles down from the top. Both Germany and England had common law for a while, but by the 20th century, both had more or less abandoned it, Germany more so than England. Therefore, by the end of World War II, when Europe unloaded, however unwillingly, its colonies, those colonies were themselves designed on principles of civil law. Thus, the first two pillars taken together mean that a Christian Protestant religion influenced and shaped everything about America's foundation of laws and defined its system of personal rights. It wasn't just that the United States was a democratic republic, but that the very premises of what a democratic republic meant were likely to be far different in the United States than anywhere else. Um, the second of the pill a third of the pillars involves economic freedom, private property rights with legal titles and deeds, and a free market economy. Now these may seem synonymous, but they are not. As Hernando de Soto pointed out, in many places of the world, there is a semblance of a free economy at work, but there's no system of title deeds to land or other property. This has two significant effects. First, it means property ownership is never secure. You can never be sure that government won't come around and grab what you have. Second, though, it means individuals with deeds and titles can use their land as collateral for business loans. This, in turn, elicits growth. In 1898, the United States had all four of these pillars. Britain had three, was slowly losing common law. France, Germany, and most European states had three, but some European states saw their religious character already beginning to fade. But around the world, 
in Africa, Asia, Latin America, few states had common law and property rights with 